Nestled in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park is a treasure trove of natural beauty and mystery. It's the most visited national park in the United States, and within its vast expanse lies the Cades Cove. This picturesque destination, favored by those with a taste for the intriguing, is a popular hike for both locals and tourists who appreciate the allure of the unknown. The cove is a labyrinth of lush foliage with an 11-mile loop road that snakes through the landscape. It's a journey that offers more than just scenic beauty. It's a chance to glimpse the park's diverse wildlife, a thrilling prospect for those who relish the thrill of the unexpected. The area is also dotted with historic structures, each with its own tale to tell, and the seasonal scenery provides a stunning backdrop, particularly in the spring and in the fall. For those who wish to delve deeper into the mysteries of the park, the Cades Cove Campground offers the perfect base. With numerous hiking and biking trails, it's an opportunity to immerse yourself in the park's unparalleled beauty. Cades Cove is a magnet for those intrigued by wildlife. Whether you prefer to drive through or camp, the cove offers ample opportunities to observe a variety of creatures, from commonly sighted deer and black bears to the more elusive coyotes, groundhogs, turkeys, and raccoons. For many, including the Martin family from Knoxville, Tennessee, Cades Cove holds a special place in their hearts. For generations, they've made an annual trip to the Smokies on Father's Day weekend, specifically to camp and hike in the Cades Cove. Their love for this beautiful area and unique experience it offers continues to draw them back year after year, each visit uncovering new adventures. One such adventure began on June 13, 1969, when William Martin, his two sons, Douglas and Dennis, and his father, Clyde, embarked on a Father's Day weekend adventure. This was Dennis's first such adventure with his father, and the group planned to hike the 13-mile loop trail from Russell to Spence Field in the Cades Cove. Both William and Clyde were experienced hikers, familiar with the trail's terrain and its hidden surprises. Even Douglas, at just nine years old, had hiked the trail before and was familiar with it. At the age of six, Dennis was no stranger to family hikes. He was able to match the group's pace as they embarked on their journey from Cades Cove. The path led them through the serene Abrams Creek and past the junction of the Crib Grab Trail. As they pressed on, they reached Russell Field, a place that could soak in the awe-inspiring scenery and relish in the wilderness. On the evening of June 13th, upon their arrival at Russell Field, the Martin family rendezvoused with Dr. Carter Martin, a family friend from Huntsville, Alabama, and his two sons. Despite the shared surname, there was no blood relation between the two Martin families. The following morning, June 14th, the group embarked on a 90-minute hike along the Appalachian Trail toward Spence Field, a location famed for its breathtaking view of the mountain laurel in full blossom during June. Upon reaching Spence Field, they were welcomed by other family members who had also made the trek. After a leisurely late lunch, the Martin children and Dr. Martin's children began to play. During this time, Dennis's father, William, overheard the boys conspiring. They were plotting a playful scheme to run on the edge of the field and sneak around, and then surprise the adults. To ensure the success of their plan, they instructed Dennis, who was wearing a bright red t-shirt, to walk alone so as to not give away their surprise. William watched the boys, amused by their laughter and camaraderie, as they planned the surprise attack. Post-lunch, Douglas Martin teamed up with Dr. Martin's son and set off in one direction, while Dennis, still in his bright red t-shirt, ventured off alone in another direction. William, Dennis's father, watched his son walk away for a few minutes before turning his attention back to the rest of the group. When the children sprang their surprise on the adults a few minutes later, it took a moment for anyone to notice that Dennis was not among them. William had assumed that Dennis would eventually join the others and was not immediately concerned. However, it took less than five minutes for a sense of unease to creep in as William realized that Dennis was not with the group. The family dispersed their voices echoing through the wilderness as they called out for Dennis, but their calls were met with silence. A sense of panic began to grip William as he and the others combed the area. Despite their frantic search, they found no trace of the young boy. William Martin was particularly distressed, as Dennis was a reserved child who always responded when his name was called. In a desperate bid to find his son, William decided to head in one direction, while his father, Clyde, went in the opposite direction. William traced the nearby Appalachian Trail, heading west and calling out for Dennis as he went. He traversed a mile before turning back towards Russell Field, then retraced his steps all the way back to Spence Field, thinking that Dennis might have gotten disoriented and followed the path they had taken earlier in the day. 
Despite his exhaustive efforts, there was still no sign of Dennis. A defeated and exhausted William returned to Spence Field alone. This was 1969, a time before cell phones or quick means to call for help. Clyde, Dennis's grandfather, realized they needed assistance and decided to hike to the nearest ranger station at Cades Cove, a daunting nine miles away. It took Clyde several hours to reach the ranger station, and by the time he arrived it was already 8.30 p.m. He reported Dennis missing, and the rangers immediately initiated a search and rescue operation. As the search for Dennis commenced, a storm rolled in, adding another layer of complexity to the already challenging task of finding the young boy. The area where Dennis was last seen was known for its intricate terrain and potentially dangerous wildlife. The heavy rain further escalated the daunting situation. Despite the challenges, a few rangers immediately began searching the immense area around Spence Field, where Dennis had last been seen. They informed dispatch that they planned to search through the night in hopes of finding the missing boy. In 1969, there was no established large-scale search and rescue operation plans in place for the Smoky Mountain National Park. Chief Ranger Sneedon organized a search crew and set up a headquarters camp at Spence Field where they strategized their efforts to locate Dennis. The search for Dennis Martin commenced on the morning of June 15th with the crew hopeful of making headway in their mission of finding the missing boy. Initially, the search party was composed of 30 men, including 5 leaders and 10 additional crews of 2-4 to four men each. However, as the search progressed, more volunteers flocked to the site to lend their support. By 1 p.m. on June 15th, the search party had swelled to 240 people, but there was a glaring lack of leadership and coordination among them. As the days passed, the search for Dennis attracted an increasing number of participants, including Boy Scouts and rescue squads from North Carolina. They brought in jeeps, trucks, and helicopters to aid in the search effort. Eventually, the search party would comprise more than 1,400 people. The sheer number of search teams and volunteers may have inadvertently impeded the search. There was no established search and rescue operation plan for the park at this time, and the search lacked a clear chain of command. Consequently, searchers were more likely obliterating evidence or any clues that could lead them to Dennis Martin. Despite the number of people involved in the search, Dennis remained missing. As the search for Dennis Martin continued, a myriad of ideas and theories were proposed about his possible fate. Some of these came from psychics and fortune tellers who reached out to the authorities offering assistance. One psychic from Los Angeles claimed to have seen the boy two and a half miles to the left of where he had last been seen by his father or brother. According to this psychic, Dennis had fallen off a steep area and was now ensnared in the bushes, but still alive. Another psychic from New Orleans suggested that the search should shift from the ground to the trees and the tree chops to find Dennis. These were just a couple examples of the dozens of calls that the search team received from psychics who claimed they had information that could lead to Dennis. Despite the search leaders following up on every call, they all turned out to be dead ends. After a week of unsuccessful searching, the FBI was called in to investigate whether there was any indication of foul play or a potential kidnapping. The FBI only gets involved in a missing person case if there is a suspicion of a crime. FBI agent Jim Wright was assigned to delve into the background of the Martin family to see if anyone could have had a motive to harm or abduct young Dennis. After an exhaustive investigation, the FBI found no evidence of any adversaries or suspicious individuals linked to the Martins. The absence of any concrete leads led the FBI and the Martins to redirect their search efforts back to the Smoky Mountains. The Martin family cooperated fully with the authorities, trying to recall every detail from their arrival at the Great Smoky Mountain National Park until the last moment when William saw Dennis walking away from the group. They recounted everything that had transpired during the initial search for Dennis in the hours before Clyde Martin reached the ranger station. Dennis went missing around 4 p.m., and it took Clyde until 8.30 p.m. to reach the station, leaving a four-and-a-half-hour window. The family searched the immediate area and enlisted the help of anyone around Spence Field who offered to assist. The FBI interviewed friends, family, and acquaintances, but found no enemies or suspicious individuals connected to the family. Thus, they returned to the Smokies to continue the search for Dennis. The Martins raised some red flags and alerted authorities to investigate potential leads. One such lead was an unnamed man from Dandridge, Tennessee, who had been camping at Spence Field around the time of Dennis' disappearance. William Martin, Dennis's father, reported to park rangers that this man, referred to as Mr. Cooper, seemed to stay close to William during most of the search efforts. 
Adding to the mystery was an unknown woman claiming to have extrasensory perception. She contacted the police department and requested to speak with Dennis's mother. After speaking with the woman, Miss Martin was advised to be cautious of Mr. Cooper from Dandridge. Concerned that the woman and Mr. Cooper might be collaborating to abduct Dennis, Miss Martin shared this possibility with the police. Despite the potential lead, there is no public record indicating that the authorities found the situation suspicious enough to launch a further investigation. Nevertheless, the Martins noted these strange occurrences and felt they warranted attention. As the search for their missing son Dennis continued, the Martins grew increasingly desperate for any explanation that could help offer hope for his safe return. They considered every possible scenario that could have led to Dennis's disappearance, including the idea that someone may have confused their family with another. However, there is no publicly available evidence to suggest that this theory held any weight. Contained within the publicly available files related to the investigation into Dennis's disappearance are several intriguing leads and witness statements. Among these is the account of a man named Harold Key from Carthridge, Tennessee. Harold and his family were in the park on the day Dennis went missing. They were in the Sea Branch area, located roughly seven miles from Spence Field, near Rowan's Creek. According to Key, he heard a disturbing scream that afternoon, which prompted him and his wife to scan their surroundings, fearing that one of their children might be under attack by a bear. Shortly thereafter, Key spotted a suspicious-looking man moving swiftly through the nearby woods. He recalled that the man appeared to be intentionally avoiding them, and described the man as rough in appearance. Several days after Harold Key and his family were in the park, they returned home and learned of Dennis Martin's disappearance through news reports. He immediately reported his account of the sickening scream and rough-looking man to park officials. However, after investigating the matter, park officials determined that Rowan's Creek was too far from Spence Field for the incidents to be related. The search for Dennis persisted for seven grueling days, and on June 20th, Dennis's seventh birthday, park ranger records show plans were being made for the grim possibility of not finding him alive. With over 1,400 volunteers participating in the search, concerns arose that uncoordinated efforts could be causing more harm than good. As a result, park officials requested volunteers cease joining the search, which had then covered over 56 square miles. As the search for Dennis Martin continued, the cost mounted. Despite the massive efforts from volunteers and law enforcement, the hope of finding Dennis alive began to wane. On Wednesday, June 25th, park officials announced that the search for Dennis Martin would soon be concluding. For the Martin family, the news was crushing. After nearly two weeks of camping out and searching tirelessly for their son, they had to pack up and return to Knoxville with heavy hearts. The uncertainty surrounding Dennis's disappearance and the lack of answers only compounded their anguish. As the search for Dennis Martin dragged on without any solid leads, the National Park Rangers made the difficult decision to suspend all major search operations on Sunday, June 29th. Despite their best efforts, they had come up empty-handed and the FBI had found no evidence to support theories of Dennis being kidnapped. In the weeks that followed, the Martin family clung to hope for any information that could lead to their son's safe return. They offered a reward of $5,000, equivalent to about $40,000 today, for anyone who could provide credible information about Dennis's whereabouts. However, as time passed and the search efforts yielded nothing new, park officials had to make the tough call to officially close the search for Dennis Martin on September 11th, 1969. The Martin family was left with no answers and the haunting memory of their son's disappearance in the Great Smoky Mountains. The disappearance of Dennis Martin has remained a mystery for over half a century, with no definitive answers as to what happened to the young boy. Various theories have been proposed, including the possibility that he became lost in the rugged terrain and perished due to the elements or an attack by wildlife. Over the years, several tips and leads have emerged. One notable tip came in 1985, when a group of illegal ginseng hunters stumbled upon what appeared to be the remains of a small boy in an area about three miles from Spence Field. The hunters found a skull and other remains, but fearing arrest, almost two decades passed before one of the men called in the tip. With a search team finally looking for the remains, they came up empty-handed, as too much time had passed. According to a report by park officials, the search for Dennis was a marked failure. Despite the presence of many people on the scene, any possible evidence that could have been preserved was likely trampled upon by the numerous individuals who came to offer their assistance. 
The failure to properly coordinate and organize the search for Dennis Martin prompted the National Park Service to completely overhaul their search and rescue operations across all national parks. As a result of these changes, agencies all over the United States and the world have also adopted these new protocols, which ultimately have resulted in saving lives. Despite the positive outcomes of these changes, it is heart-wrenching to know that they came too late to rescue Dennis Martin. His disappearance remains an unsolved mystery, and his tragic case has served as a catalyst for reforming search and rescue procedures across the country and across the world. If you've enjoyed this content from a universe of mystery, please like, subscribe, share, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content.